Okay, so right now what I want to talk about is basic camera settings for uh, going out into the field to make photographs. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is if I'm doing handheld photography, I want to make sure I use a camera neck strap to protect the camera so if something happens, the camera's secure. The other thing I want to point out before we get too far is the importance of using a tripod. Um, if I am photographing anything but photojournalism, action, candid photography, I am generally going to use a tripod because it's going to allow me to control, uh, slow the process down, think a little bit more about my composition, and allow me to make multiple exposures with the same composition. So uh, I will typically work with a tripod and I keep a base plate on my camera so it's real easy to have a quick release on and off. And now my camera's here. And I'm going to do that for right now so that we can uh, talk about the basic exposure settings that I set before I ever go out into the field. The first thing I set on my camera is going to be the ISO setting. That's going to be determined by the type of shooting scenario I'm working with. If I am working indoors with available light and I'm not using any uh, auxiliary flash or other lighting equipment, then I have to work with a higher ISO. Typically indoors I will set my ISO as high as 1600 uh, or 3200. Today's modern cameras can handle those low light situations extremely well. So I routinely will work indoors at an ISO 1600. If I'm going to be outdoors, then I'm going to typically work at an ISO between 400 and 500, which is kind of a sweet spot for a lot of these digital SLRs in that they have really excellent image quality. And generally what that means is I can shoot at, going back to that basic daylight exposure, if it's a bright sunny day, I'm going to be able to hand hold this camera and photograph at a 500th of a second, which means I'll be able to stop most action if I need to and still have a really small aperture and excellent depth of field uh, to get everything in critical focus. Now, if I am going to be working in a situation where I'm doing landscape photography and I'm working on a tripod, then I will set my ISO as low as I can. Uh, for this particular Nikon, uh, ISO 100 is the lowest that it goes to. And that's because I can go ahead and slow the shutter speed down less than uh, 500 of a second. I can slow it down to a full second or even longer because the tripod's going to hold the camera steady during the exposure. Now I'm going to put this back on for a moment and give you just one other quick setting. If I'm doing handheld photography, it's very important for you to understand that you use a shutter speed that is no slower than one over the focal length of the lens. So if you're using a 50 millimeter lens like what I have on here right now, then I want to use a shutter speed that's no slower than a 50th of a second. And in reality, I will set it automatically to 60th of a second because that is going to avoid camera motion being visible. If you ever pay attention to holding a pair of binoculars, you notice all that motion shake, the least little twitching, uh, it, it shows up in the image. The longer the focal length of the lens, the more telephoto lens it is, then the more that camera motion will show. Shorter the lens, the less it shows. We're setting our camera controls and I've set my ISO based upon what my general shooting scenario would be. Um, again, reviewing that if I'm indoors, typically ISO 1600. If I'm outdoors, typically 4 or 500 ISO. If I'm working uh, with landscape photography in a tripod, I'll go ahead and set it lower to like ISO 100. Or if I'm working in the studio with studio uh, strobes where I have a lot of light that I can uh, burst into the scene, I will go ahead and in the studio set it also to ISO 100. The next thing, before we ever get into making exposures, I need to set up the camera though uh, for two other settings. The first one being the file size and format. So I'm going to go into the menu and I'm going to set, if at all possible, when it goes to image quality, I'm going to set it to the raw camera setting. 
And in fact, with this particular Nikon, I can set it to capture both RAW and a JPEG. And that's my general walk around setting for my camera. If I have to shoot really, really, really fast, like sports photography, I might set it to JPEG. Uh, to be able to shoot more continuous exposure, multiple frames per second. But my general walk around setting for my camera for image quality is going to be RAW uh, plus a JPEG. The reason I want the RAW camera mode, and if you can at all set your camera to RAW, is because no matter what exposure I uh, end up taking with my camera in terms of white balance, which is the next setting we're going to talk about, Regardless of what the white balance was at the time that I set the uh, camera exposure, I can always change the white balance without doing any destruction to my image. So when we're working in RAW, what we're really going to be talking about when you get to the post-processing uh, section is non-destructive, that I have all the RAW data and I can process it any color temperature I want. I can change exposure settings within limitations as well. So RAW gives me the greatest flexibility afterwards okay now when i talk about image quality i have really two settings and that is i have raw plus jpeg and if i'm set to raw it's generally going to capture the full resolution of uh, the sensor in this case of this nikon d610 it is going to give me a 24 megapixel exposure if i'm shooting with jpeg i do have the added benefit of changing the actual file size to whether it be either full frame or a half of that data or a quarter of that data. And the, and the idea there is if I were photographing a wedding, I may not want 24 megapixel images for 2,000 images. If I'm photographing a wedding, uh, each of those images at full resolution opens up to 96 megabytes. So can you imagine how much data that is? So there are times when I do want to go in and shoot JPEG and turn the file size down relative to the project that I'm doing. So we need to know what these controls are. But in general, as you're first starting out, it is safest to start out with a little bit more. We can always downsample later on. So I recommend that you set your camera to RAW. If you can set it to RAW plus a JPEG, there's a little added benefit there as well. I will give you an extra bonus tip of a way that beginning photographers can start to improve their composition. The way you can improve your composition is by setting your image picture mode on your camera to monochrome. So what this does, and, and I have it set right now on, on monochrome for my camera, what this does is it allows me to capture the raw image, which will have all the color information. Remember, raw is non-destructing. I have everything the camera captured. I've got access to the color. The monochrome will show me the image on the back of the camera. When I preview an image, it will show it to me in black and white. And the reason I like setting it for black and white is because black and white is the way the brain perceives distance. It's the way it perceives our place in the world. And it allows me to see all the design elements, the point, line, shape, form, texture, pattern, right? Color is just one design element. And so, and it's such a powerful design element. Color will overwhelm an image to where I think I've got a great image because I like the color when in fact I don't have a particularly strong composition. So when I am out in the field photographing, I have my camera play back the image if I'm going to review an image and see if I got the shot. I want to see it in monochrome because it's going to give me the space, the depth perception. Uh, and remember photography is about trying to create the illusion of depth on a flat two-dimensional surface and it's going to really emphasize the line, the shape, the form, the texture, the pattern, all these design elements that are so critical uh, in addition to the color information. So a little bonus information about shooting in monochrome picture mode while photographing in a raw image quality. Even though the image shows me a black and white image in the camera, it's saying, you know, if you were to process it this way, it would be monochrome, this is what it looks like. 
When I'm shooting RAW plus JPEG, the JPEG is always a processed image. So if I shoot in monochrome, the JPEG will be only black and white. But that RAW file has all the color information. And if you import a RAW file, if you, you import your card or your camera files into Lightroom, if Lightroom sees that the same image is available as both RAW and JPEG, it will ignore the JPEG and just bring in the RAW image. And so you will then have all that color information. Okay, just to review, um, we're getting our camera ready to go out in the field and photograph. And we've got some basic settings we need to set up on our camera. The first one is the ISO. The second one is the image quality, uh, where we want to set it to RAW if possible. If we're working in JPEG, then we also need to set the image size to either the maximum resolution typically, or a smaller resolution if a job requires something less. The next setting that we want to set is our white balance. Now I will tell you that if we are uh, working in raw mode, it really doesn't matter what the white balance setting is because we are going to control that in post-production. So I generally will set my white balance to the auto white balance. However, if I'm working in JPEG, then I need to really try to get that color balance as accurate as possible. So I will set it to either one of the presets for daylight or for a cloudy setting or for a um, interior tungsten setting and I'll use one of the presets. So like I said, if I'm working in camera raw, I will set my white balance to the auto white balance because I'm not gonna worry about it until later because working with a raw file, I have access to set the color balance in post-production manually. Um, and let's talk a minute, what is white balance? Well, white balance refers to the um, color temperature as expressed in kelvins of different light sources. And so you'll notice that the sun has different colors at different times of day. When it's high in the sky, it has a cooler color. And in sunset and sunrise, it's a warmer color. And you'll notice if you start paying attention to the color around you, that shade light will be cool and direct sunlight will be warmer. Now, what the human eye does is it compensates for whatever color temperature your light source is around you, your eyes will compensate automatically to neutralize the color cast. And so what we're talking about is how do we get a neutral color cast under a particular light source? When we see the color change, what we're talking about is color metamorphism, that uh, if I look at a white piece of paper under daylight and then immediately go indoors and uh, look at under lamplight, that paper will for just a moment look yellow until the eyes and the brain go, oh, I need to color correct for that tungsten light source, that lamplight that's so warm. If you'll notice at dusk, if I'm outdoors and I see people indoors turning lights on, those lights generally look yellow because I'm outdoors and the dominant light source is a very cool, it's a high Kelvin temperature. When we talk about the Kelvin temperature scale, the higher the number, the bluer the light source. The lower the number, the redder the light source. So we go from the visible color spectrum of red, orange, yellow, uh, blue, indigo, violet. And I, I miss greens in there as well, but green is almost like gray for me because it's my uh, go-to um, exposure setting for what I think is equivalent to a middle gray exposure, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Anyway, as we set white balance, if I'm working in RAW, I can set it to auto white balance. If I'm working in JPEG, I need to set it to either a preset that closely approximates my lighting. That way, when I go in post-production to make minor corrections to it, I'm not making dramatic changes that will cause what are known as color shifts. Uh, later on, and if I have the ability to set the Kelvin uh, color temperature, and I, I can actually use a calibration chart and do a test exposure and white balance off of a, a uh, white card in order to get a proper Kelvin uh, temperature. So for now, I'm going to assume that we're shooting in raw mode, we're shooting with auto white balance, and we're going to go on to the next uh, setting which is something you generally set once and leave it alone, and that is the shooting uh, mode. 
on this camera, I can be shooting in a single mode or a continuous mode, multiple frames per second. So I typically uh, err on the side of one exposure at a time. I don't generally want to uh, look like Snoopy as the Red Baron going by having the push the button down and it's just firing multiple exposures. Rarely do I find myself photographing that way. So generally I set my camera to the single exposure mode. Another setting that I would want to set on my camera is the camera metering mode. Uh, and I will tell you that with most modern cameras, your most successful metering mode is going to be a matrix metering mode. Otherwise, I will typically set it to a center weighted mode uh, for most situations. And we'll have a whole another lesson about camera metering modes. So. Typically, I've got my white balance set, I've got my uh, shooting mode set, I've got my meter mode set, and now I'm ready to go out and make my exposure mode setting as well. And for the exposure modes, the one I use the most is manual exposure mode, and I will tell you why in a little while. Uh, I, as a photographer, need to be able to control what the exposure is manually to be able to do things like silhouettes, to be able to show that universal graphic quality of a silhouette in a scene. Or I need to override the exposure meter because it's giving me a false reading because the subject's in shade and the background's in bright sunlight and I need to be able to compensate for that. So manual exposure is typically what I will do. The other settings that we have are aperture priority where I set the aperture and the camera will automatically set the shutter speed for me. These are the auto exposure settings and that's what your cell phone does. It does auto exposure everything. Uh, but with aperture priority I have control over depth of field by changing my aperture. It sets the shutter speed. The shutter priority and if I'm doing handheld auto exposure I will go to shutter priority and set my shutter to the um, the minimum shutter speed that I need based upon the focal length of, of the lens. So typically it's 60 or 125th of a second because what will happen there is I, I could accidentally, if I'm an aperture priority and I stop my lens down too much, it will end up using a slow shutter speed and I'll get a blurry photo. So with shutter priority, that's probably the, the more common uh, auto exposure setting that I work with. The other one is program mode where it chooses for me both the aperture and the shutter speed necessary uh, to make a correct exposure. And then finally, a lot of cameras will have a green setting with a P, or in this case it has a little auto, and it says auto everything. And the difference between auto everything and program mode is auto everything will also adjust the ISO setting. It will control all three elements of the exposure triangle aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. So if I go indoors, it'll automatically crank up the ISO to a higher ISO. If I go outdoors, it'll automatically lower it as well. And that's known as the, you know, push the button and don't think about it. I don't want to call it the dummy button, but it is the most automated, don't have to think about the exposure setting. But it also is the one that gives me the least control over what my images look like.